All right, it's one o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is uh, Matt Delacluz, General Manager of Reco Rents. I'd like to thank all of you for taking your time out of your busy schedules today to join us for our webinar on ventilation and IAQ measurement applications. Our presenter today is Jim Schumacher from TSI. In this 45-minute webinar, he will cover the following. Common applications in IEQ and ventilation testing, how HVAC energy conservation practices affect air quality and worker comfort, health, and productivity, picking the right probe for your measurement needs, pressure, temperature, air velocity, airflow, CO2, and VOCs, application tips and best practices, and ask the expert We'll have questions at the end. Uh, Jim Schumacher is a product specialist for TSI ventilation and IAQ instrumentation. He has more than 25 years working with HVAC instrumentation applications. His current responsibilities focus on product development. He holds a bachelor's degree from Northern Illinois University. We welcome Jim as a speaker and thank him for sharing his expertise with our customers. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Jim. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks everyone for uh, for attending this webinar. Uh, thanks again to Rayco for hosting this. Um, the focus, uh, we're looking at about 40, 45 minute presentation, and we're gonna, just gonna talk about some uh, common measurement applications with the, uh, the TSI 9565 VelociCal. Just a couple of slides to do a quick overview. The, the 9565 VelociCal, um, it's a multi-purpose instrument and that uh, works with a suite of different types of probes for doing indoor air quality, flows, velocity, pressure, and so on. Um, these probes are a plug and play, have all the calibration stored within the probe, so the probe's calibration would follow the meter. Um, features an internal barometric pressure sensor used to perform air density corrections, and I have some examples later on in this presentation to go through that in a little bit uh, more detail. Stored data can be uh, communicated via Bluetooth, um, we also have logging software and downloading software, depending on, on um, the type of data that you want to uh, print out. Um, it also features some calculations for specific applications or workflow. Um, so one of the applications that you know we're not going to go into is, uh, for instance, is that leakage test. And in the bottom right. You'll see what's called um, what we call our PANDA, a positive and negative duct accreditation system, and the 9565 VelociCalc is used with that system to calculate pass/fail results for duct leakage for both uh, SMACNA protocols and European protocols. As far as some of the applications in uh, the types of industry this product is used for, uh, quite extensively with mechanical contractors, test and balance. Uh, and commissioning, both retro and new commissioning. Um, we do see a lot of play in the indoor air quality space for doing investigations, trending over time. Uh, certifiers kind of use, um, those are for specific applications say, such as clean rooms, pharmaceutical, laboratories, hospitals, and so on that do some critical measurements in uh, mission critical or life safety situations. Uh, you can see some of the different uh, applications from clean room, bio hoods, uh, thermal comfort studies, and so on. These are just uh, some of the industries and applications that this product um, can meet. This next slide just kind of shows some of the different um, probes and uh, capabilities that the instrument is capable of measuring. On the left side, you kind of see more on the ventilation, for whether it's using uh, fetal probes for doing duct traversing, thermal anemometers for doing low velocity, uh, high accurate measurements, or, um, or rotating vein anemometry. On the right side are some other probes that can be plugged in, thermocouples, IAQ, and VOC probes. Um, we're going to be focusing a bit more on the left side for the ventilation measurements, but we will be touching on some of the IEQ probes um, for doing a specific measurement to meet um, ASHRAE 62 guidelines for minimum ventilation air. But this kind of gives you a, a quick overview on the different uh, types of probes and case and features and so on. 
So we're going to go right into some measurements and applications. And one of the, we're going to kind of start with some of the basics. Um, the differential pressure sensor is a built-in pressure sensor, and we'll go through about six different applications, measurement applications, that utilizes the differential pressure ports. Um, pretty straightforward. We use a differential pressure sensor for doing um, um, high side and low side pressures. Uh, it's a very linear output, temperature compensation, and uh, does require zeroing, and there is a zeroing feature on the instrument to um, uh, zero the sensor prior to taking measurements. So when we look at the differential pressure ports and what you can do with them and where you can measure, um, one of the basic ones is static pressure. Static pressure is the, the amount of pressure within the ductwork that is exerting equally on all sides of the duct. Kind of like, um, you know, you blow up a balloon, the, the, more, the, the bigger the balloon, the more static pressure is exerted against the walls of the balloon to make it, um, make it uh, hold its shape. So when we look at static pressure, that's a very important um, part of the HVAC design. You have a design engineer specifying fans and so on. Uh, has to look at uh, the entire duct layout and kind of calculate what the resistance is with all those uh, duct runs, um, elbows, dampers, um, things of that nature in order to calculate what the, the resistance the fan needs to overcome in order to push the, the airflow um, all the way throughout the ductwork. So um, you, know, you can kind of see in the little graph there, the uh, pressure versus flow. You know, if you have a lot um, high static pressure that you're overcoming, you're not going to be putting out as much flow as you need. And by reducing the static pressure within the ductwork, you can increase your, your volume flow. So that's basically what the fan is going to need to overcome is any type of resistance in the, in the ductwork. The other thing that you can do is um, differential pressure. Measuring differential pressure is basically measuring the difference between uh, two pressure points. Very common uh, to measure differential pressure or pressure drops across um, reheat coils, heating and cooling coils, filter banks, and so on. You know, as the, uh, the filter starts building up um, dust and debris on it, it's going to create more of a resistance, a higher pressure drop, which will restrict the flow going through your, through your ductwork. Um, a lot of facilities for you know, commercial facilities, they'll have dedicated differential pressure transducers mounted across the, the filters and at a predetermined uh, set point um, would indicate when that filter would need to be changed. So you know, using it for measuring uh, differential pressures, filters, coils, and so on, very common um, practice in the HVAC field. Another usage is measuring uh, room or, or building pressures. Um, very critical uh, type of measurement if you're into like laboratories, hospitals, clean rooms, isolation rooms, and so on. Basically, like in a laboratory, you're, um, which is going to be your, your secondary containment is the lab space. Primary source of containment would be the fume hoods. But in order to keep any um, um, adverse chemicals or vapors or so on from Getting out of the lab space, that lab space will be under a negative pressure, meaning there'll be more exhaust flow than supply flow in order to create that negative pressure in the space. And a lot of times the laboratories, you know, they'll have a room pressure monitors or controllers, and to spot check those measurements on the on the room controllers, you can definitely use the uh, the Velocicalc 9565 to measure that differential pressure to one, not only ensure that your laboratory space is under a negative pressure, but also to verify that the room pressure monitor is, um, is reading the way it should, is giving you an accurate measurement. Um, other thing is uh, building pressure, you know, in which the outdoors would be the reference space. Basically, any commercial building should be under a slightly positive pressure. If there is a negative pressure in the building, you'll start um, um, drawing in, you know, um, unconditioned air, um, pollutants, or so on, from outside the building, inside the space itself. 
And if you've ever gone to a restaurant or a store and you open the door and you hear a whoosh of air, generally that's uh, you're sensing the, the difference in pressure between inside the space and outside the space. Another application for using a pressure report is measuring flow. And in this case, we're looking at flow from a VAV box, variable air volume box, or a uh, installed flow sensor in the ductwork. Um, on that uh, lower right-hand corner, lower right-hand photo of the uh, VAV box, you can kind of see a, a blue and a red tube that are connected to a differential pressure man manifold that's installed at the inlet of that box, and we can tap into the, those tubings to measure the differential pressure. Now, with a VAV box with an installed flow cross or, or a velocity sensor, what that manufacturer of that box would be doing is giving you a chart um, based off the inlet size, what the square footage is, and what's called the K-factor. So basically, we're measuring the differential pressure across that flow manifold, multiplying that by the K factor from the manufacturer, and that'll give us our flow calculation. So it's a very quick, easy way of taking a total flow inside a, a room or a space, um, rather than traversing or using a hood on each um, diffuser in that space. You can just go to the VAV box that supplies all the condition to supply flow into the space and measure right there to determine what your total flow is. Now with this one, um, measuring the differential pressure out of an outlet or a diffuser also uses a K-factor. Um, this, this method here is uh, probably not so common here in the United States, but it's very common in the Nordics, in um, Sweden, Finland, and Norway. So basically, with um, our install base over there, they'll use a micromanometer, and within the outlets of their supply and return grills, supply diffuser return grills, they'll have pressure taps in which they can connect their ma um, micromanometer to, measure the differential, provide that K factor to get another direct flow measurement out of that particular diffuser. And then they can uh, modulate an internal damper to adjust the flow to meet the design specifications. Another usage of the differential pressure, which is um, very common in your test and balance world, is using a um, using a pitot probe and doing uh, doing a duct traverse. So basically, you know, if you think of a duct, you know, the airflow is not going to be uniform within that duct. You can kind of see that picture down at the, the bottom with the fan in the flow profile. Basically, you're going to want to do a traverse where that flow profile gets relatively flat, you know, less turbulence. And in order to get a um, good average of the flow at that point, you're going to do, take a series of uh, uh, measurements, a bunch of different samples at various points within that duct in order to calculate what your flow is. Um, if you get into any high temperature applications or with uh, high um, particles in the airstream, um, pretty much using a pitot probe is going to be the only way you're going to be able to take those flows. Um, the pitot probes, is, their stainless steel construction can withstand temperatures up to about 880 degrees Celsius and are you know, prevalent in um, uh, monitoring flows in stacks or chimneys or some type of industrial process. Um, dust collection systems, um, big, uh, which is another usage for for doing a using the pitot probes. And since they work on differential pressure, the high temperature or the particles in the airstream is not going to go through the tube, through the tubing into the meter and mess up any sensors. So even though you may see an instrument operating. Um, conditions, you know, temperature limits with any micromanometer, uh, since it's just measuring pressure, the, the probe itself, the pitot probe will be in that airstream, um, but any temperatures or dust or particles will not make it through to the instrument. Another air velocity instrument um, is the rotating vane anemometers. 
These work off, um, uh, these are 100 millimeter, four or uh, four inch diameter vein anemometers. Um, and it basically, every time the vein spins over the Hall effect sensor, it's creating a pulse. And uh, we count those pulses, we equate and calculate what the RPM is, and then calculate what the air velocity is. Common applications are, you know, th these are going to be used to measure the phase velocity or phase flow. Of uh, So you're not going to put in any duct work. So, you know, phase velocity or flow of a grill, a filter, um, heating or cooling coils in a large air handling system, or, you know, using it for kitchen exhaust at the canopy, or even in, um, you know, your local uh, fast food place, where they have the grease baffles uh, over the, the the grills and the fryers and so on. This is a way that you can take a uh, measurement right at those grease baffles. Uh, the four-inch vein uh, provides averaging over a four-inch diameter, and the inherent dampening characteristics of a mechanical meter limit will uh, reduce any type of turbulence or fluctuating airflows that you may see in your airstream. Now, uh, in the center picture, there are also little cone kits that can be adapted to make it into a little hood, which is ideal for small bathroom out, bathroom exhausts or small outlets. And these are generally good for usage up to about 70 CFM, 70 cubic feet per minute. Now, in some areas, the uh, vein anemometers are used in um, for also doing phase velocities of fume hoods of bio or bio cabinets. Now, in those applications, those are predominantly, um, uh, when they use a rotating vein, that's pretty common in Europe, using, especially in the UK, using a uh, um, thermal um, As Here in the States, we mainly use thermal anemometry for bio hoods and fume hoods, but in other parts, uh, you know, because it's kind of written into some of our standards, but in other parts of the world, rotating vein anemometers would be used such as this application here, where this technician is measuring the downflow velocity in a uh, biosafety cabinet, um, and this would be a common product uh, used in Europe for this specific application. Uh, we'll talk about this application a little later, focusing on thermal anemometry. Um, but as far as rotating veins, uh, they're easy to use. They're quite commonly used in um, in the residential community, but they do have commercial viability as well. A couple more application photos, um, like uh, the one down on the bottom, two guys with a hard hat. You can kind of see where they gridded off the entrance to this atrium. You can kind of see the tape on the walls, uh, the ceiling and on the floor. So they're basically um, put a, made a grid pattern and they're placing the vein anemometer in each one of those grids to calculate the velocity in each each grid, come up with the total, multiply that by the, um, the area in square feet of that opening, and that'll give them the flow that's coming in or out of that atrium. So right now we're gonna move into thermal anemometry. Thermal anemometers, um, they have a wide measurement range, you know, 30 to 10,000 feet per minute. They're very fast acting. Um, one thing to keep in mind, these are thermal anemometry, and I'll kind of talk about how those work, but they're designed to work with uh, only air. So if you got any uh, other um, gas mixtures other than air, uh, you're not going to really want to use it for that. If there's any um, potential combustionables, um, not the not the product for that. So basically, if you can breathe it, you can measure it. And uh, probes come in various configurations, straight or articulating, with or without humidity, and they are full telescopic. As far as the construction, the the sensor is a uh, uses an RTD. We have a platinum wound uh, platinum wire wound on a substrate and we encase it in ceramic. And as the, resist the, the, temp as the temperature changes across that sensor, the resistance changes, and then we're able to plot that resistance 
Um, actually, we measure the current, and that's how we kind of calculate the, the air velocity. <clears throat> so thermal anemometer, uh, it's also referred to as a constant overheat sensor. So basically, the velocity sensor is maintained at about 90 degrees Celsius over ambient. Um, as the, as the um, air passes across that sensor, you're going to lose heat due to convection. We can measure that heat loss, and then in order to maintain that initial overheat temperature, we add, uh, we increase the, the current. So the higher the current draw across the sensor, this is the higher the velocity, it's very stable, and that is what's used to compute uh, velocity in feet per minute or meters per second. Uh, the temperature sensor in there, that's also used for temperature compensation. So if you put the a velocity sensor in an airstream, and there's slight fluctuations in the in the temperature coming across that te um, sensor. We can adjust the velocity output to compensate for any slight changes in the temperature in the airstream as we're measuring it. Some of the applications of um, low velocity measurements are key. Um, those are probably some of the the, the main measurement applications of thermal anemometry. Um, duct traverses, you can get into some higher velocities, but when you get into uh, filter velocity, that can be a couple hundred feet per minute. Fume hoods, about 100 feet per minute. Bio cabinets could be a little bit less than that. But uh, for repeatable, accurate, low velocity applications and measurements, the thermal anemometers are going to be the way to go. So we kind of talked about doing duct traversing with a pedal probe, um, but you can also do it with a thermal anemometer. And one of the benefits is if, with the thermal anemometer is not only does it measure the uh, or calculate the flow in the duct, but you can also measure the temperature and humidity if you know we have those sensors installed. So that kind of takes care of uh, some of your psychrometrics. So you're taking your air velocity, air flow in the duct. You're also getting humidity, wet bulb, dew point, and temperature measurements as well. Uh, you store that data, download it, and then you can use that for a report that data for uh, to incorporate into your into your reports. So when we get into um, and so the, this slide was more on on general HVAC or test adjusting and balancing applications. Um, measuring air velocity for critical um, settings, fume hoods, bio cabinets, and so on. Um, we do have, there are a bunch of applicable standards that you see there, and this gets into the low velocity applications. Um, the photo up on the right, that gentleman there is measuring the downflow velocity in a bio cabinet. Looks like a class three, a glove box. Um, and then the photo down on the bottom, it's doing a face velocity of a laboratory fume hood. So fume hoods, basically what they are is they're the primary source of containment within a laboratory space. Um, they're, they're connected to uh, ductwork, to the exhaust duct. So all the air that conditioned air that comes into the lab space uh, will be exhausted through the general exhaust and through the fume hoods. And the purpose of the fume hood is to protect the worker from any uh, exposure to dangerous chemicals and so on. And um, you know, real, pretty straightforward. There are guidelines in, um, on how to do that. ASHRAE 110 for the states. EN14175 is very popular and used as a standard for testing fume hoods in, in Europe. NSF49 gets into a bio cabinet. So typically with a fume hood, you know, um, with this application, you're best suited using some type of articulated probe. So in that photo down on the below, the lab manager or quality assurance lab manager is uh, using an articulated probe and placing it at each point in that grid to come up with a velocity to uh, calculate what the average velocity is going through that, through that fume hood. Now, biological safety cabinets, they're, they're used to protect the work, worker and the, um, the, um, 
and the experiment or whatever they're testing that they're doing within that space. Typically, it'll be some type of pathogen, could be a virus, bacterial, microorganism. And what the bio cabinets do is they're HEPA filtered air that um, provide very clean air and a laminar flow pattern coming across the work surface and protects both the worker and the uh, experiment or whatever uh, testing that they're doing in there. And one of the applications is downflow velocity. So basically, uh, depending on the uh, biological safety cabinet, the, the instrument, um, what the technician would do is they would be dividing it uh, about four inches above the sash. They'll, they'll put a grid plane, uh, and each grid is about six by six inch. And they'll mount the, the probes on a ring stand and put the probe in each one of those grid places. Uh, grid points, take a velocity measurement, and then come um, from all those points and then cal calculate what the average velocity of the downflow is within that box, within the bio cabinet. The other application of thermal anemometers is what's called the inflow velocity. Now, you can use a thermal anemometer for this, um, or they have uh, another device called uh, direct inflow measurement where we, you'd use a, you know, like a um, CSI or Alnor bolometer capture hood with a um, special hood and frame kit that covers up the um, the inflow, the inlet to the bio cabinet. But using a thermal anemometer, you know, they have uh, different bio cabinet manufacturers have attachments that can clamp on to the to the sash right out in the front, where you can mount your hot wire probe and adjust it and calculate what the inflow velocity is. To that cabinet. So for bio cabinet, bio safety cabinets, you know, with a hot wire thermal anemometer, they use it for doing the inflow velocity uh, coming into the cabinet and the downflow velocity coming from the uh, HEPA filtered air that's at the top of the cabinet. Another application is laminar flow benches. So these are these are basically. It'll, uh, they're filtered air. There's a there's a fan that brings in the room air, filters it, and, and that air, filtered air, then comes across the work environment. And this is where they can do some um, um, some lower level um, experiments and testing. Um, but the same thing, using a hot wire, they would grid uh, make a grid in front of that that uh, HEPA filter take velocity measurements within each each point and then come up with the average. If there's any difference in the uniformity, if you know one side or corner of the filter is a higher flow or higher velocity or a lower velocity than another point, um, that can be an indication of dirt or debris filling, filling up that point of the filter and causing issues with the uniformity or the airflow velocity profile coming across the clean bench. Another application, in, uh, more in a, in a, again with the clean rooms, is measuring the filter velocity in the, in the ceiling or in the sides. So basically what they would do there is they're testing for, for the uniformity. You know, if I'm, if I'm expecting to get 150 feet per minute coming out of that filter, um, same thing, they divide it up in a grid pattern, uh, mount the probe at different heights or distances off the face. Those heights are dependent on, on the, the lab space, it's on the, uh, the clean room itself, and um, you know what the uh, uh, clean room manager is, is looking for. But basically, the same thing, they grid it out, they'll use a hot wire to measure that velocity to make sure that it's you know, relatively laminar. You want straight laminar, non-turbulent airflow coming out of here, out of the filter. If uh, the filter is damaged or there's a buildup of dust or particulates on the inlet side, that can adversely affect the velocity profile coming into the clean space, which could create turbulence and impact the um, the work that's being done. Moving into just a quick slide on some industrial hygiene applications. Industrial hygiene uh, managers, uh, generally you're looking at uh, safety, you know, documentation, 
make sure that your you know workers have um, you know the right if they're working on grinding wheels or things like that whether they have the appropriate uh, respirators or masks or filtration um, thermal anemometers or 9565 in particular is a useful device that can be used in a, many different applications from you know snorkel exhaust to paint booths to grinding wheels and so on so it's a very versatile instrument that not only handles your test and balance applications, but also your hygiene safety applications as well. One thing to keep in mind is uh, air density. Um, we calibrate our products to our reference to standard velocity at standard conditions. And so, which is, 70 degrees Celsius at 29.92 inches of mercury, generally what you would see at sea level. So, and that's very important, you know, for different manufacturers or uh, of instrumentation or, or VAV box manufacturers uh, don't, or fan manufacturers don't have a baseline, it'll be very difficult for, for a uh, HVAC professional to, um, have a starting point. You know, where where did the where did this data come from, and how how can I um, reproduce it? So, t um, air density correction is is something that definitely sh uh, needs to be um, uh, considered when taking measurements, especially at higher elevations. So, when we talk about air density, we're basically talking actual air density and standard air density. So at standard conditions, um, 70 degrees Celsius, 29.92 inches of mercury, if you had, took a cubic foot of air at sea level, that should weigh about 0.075 pounds. As you go into increase in elevation, you're going to have less molecules, the air becomes less dense, and uh, you'll have less weight So uh, in that one cubic foot. So it's very important to compensate for that air density difference um, in your instrumentation and your measurements. So that's where the barometric pressure sensor comes in, and that's where the temperature sensor comes in on the thermal anemometer probes. Um, just a rule of thumb, you know, if you're you're if you're you know outside 10% of standard conditions, you're going to want to consider measuring to actual conditions. For setting your instrument to measure actual. So, quick um, example of that is um, okay. We're taking a critical measurement, a laboratory fume hood. It could be in a university, government building, or or a research center, or so on. Um, typically, fume hoods. You know, I know they 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 do have some um, you know high performance, lower velocity ones. But typical fume hood, they're looking for an average face velocity coming into that hood about 100 feet per minute. So if you are measuring at a high altitude, 7,320 feet, for instance, which is the elevation of Los Alamos Labs, if you have your instruments sent to standard air density, your measurements will be low, since the, the density of air in one cubic foot is going to be much less at 7,000 feet then at uh, sea level, so you have less molecules coming across that sensor and it, uh, the velocity sensor, so then it'll interpret that as a low velocity. But you set it to standard condition, to actual conditions where you take the actual barometric pressure and the actual temperature, and then you'd be able to um, basically get it to read closer to design. So by not switching your your measurement from actual to standard could be the difference between passing and failing a face velocity test. I'm going to take a few slides, uh, a little bit on advanced calculations or workflows. And what these are, we define these are as um, built-in um, workflows or protocols for specific measurements. So, you know, you go in for like heat flow calculation, which is one of them. Um, you just go into that menu, they'll guide you on setup and so on. Um, so what a lot of what these workflows do is that it eliminates some of the hand calculation errors. 
um, speeds up your measurement process, and then you don't have to always carry around documentation to do, excuse me, to do a specific test or, or a calculation. So within the instrument, there's an applications menu, um, and uh, got five different um, workflows customized that, um, that can be conducted. Draft rate, heat flow, and turbulence intensity, that uses a thermal anemometer probe. Um, draft rate, it gets into human comfort, occupant comfort, you know, how many people are satisfied. Heat flow gets into BTU per hours, efficiency of a heating or cooling coil. Turbulence, that's something uh, for laminar air, air streams, so they can uh, quantify a, um, what the airstream turbulence intensity is from like a filter, hoods, and so on. Uh, percent outside air calculation, that is used in conduction, conjunction with um, meeting the ASHRAE 62 minimum, minimum ventilation guidelines. And then uh, the leakage test, kind of briefly touched on earlier, which uh, refers to uh, built-in duct leakage testing protocols for Europe and for North America. And that uses the, what we call that, uh, the PANDA system, positive negative duct accreditation system, which is the, uh, the rig on the right. Um, so we're just going to take a couple, a look at a couple of these, um, these workflows. So you have ASHRAE 62. It um, talks about, um, it's a very concise document, uh, standard, and um, gets into um, a lot of different aspects, but one of them is uh, the amount of air, uh, fresh air, outside air, fresh air ventilation coming in uh, to a given space um, based on uh, number of occupants in a space or the square footage of the space. So by having the proper amount of fresh air ventilation coming into your, into your facility, um, and that'll uh, reduce any CO2 issues, concentration, I mean, some of you, if you remember back in the 70s, the energy crisis, uh, one of the ways that uh, commercial building owners were trying to you know, save a little money is to reduce the amount of outdoor air coming into their system. So by removing, limiting the amount of outdoor air coming in, your, your reheat, your cooling um, is not used as extensively, so you save a little money. However, the offset is, is what's called sick building syndrome. So you're recirculating all those pollutants, the CO2 levels are building up, and then you know people start feeling groggy, nauseous, and so on. And that was a, a direct contributor to the whole sick, sick building syndrome is lack of fresh ventilation air. So with, um, to measure to measure this, um, the amount of outdoor air coming into the space, uh, you can do it with either carbon dioxide or temperature. <clears throat> if you're using temperature, um, temperature will work as if, if you have a, um, a pretty good difference between the inside and outside, inside the building and outside. If, if the difference is only a few degrees, five, six degrees, using temperature for this calculation probably wouldn't be the uh, best way to go. Um, so using carbon dioxide has been shown to be a, a very good indicator of the amount of fresh air coming into the space. So basically what they would be doing here is they go in the application percent outside air, they would go outside, take a measurement, go to the supply duct, take a measurement, go to return duct, take a measurement, and then calculate the percentage of outside air coming into their space or in the building as a whole. So as an example of that, um, you know, we see that uh, picture of that VAV box and a little schematic or a little drawing of a, um, um, uh, a duct uh, with the VAV box and some branches coming off. Now, you can also do take those, so what we need to do with this uh, measurement is now that we know what the percentage of outdoor air is coming in, we need to know what the uh, percentage of outdoor air, uh, outdoor air and CFM per person. So you see a picture of a bolometer capture hood that can be used to measure each one of those six diffusers, or you can use the Velocicalc 9565 
with the pressure ports, tap into that VAV box, input the box manufacturer's K factor to determine what the total flow is being delivered to that space that is being fed by those six, six diffusers. Um, now, and this is on the left there, you kind of see a little chart um, application and recommended a CFM per person of outdoor air. There is another chart that shows the uh, CFM per square footage. So not only can we can uh, you can determine the amount of outdoor air per person, uh, you can also do it by um, per square footage. So in this example, we have a conference room. We uh, went through the outside air percentage of outside air calculation using uh, CO2. We came up with about 11 percent. We measured the total flow in that space is about 850 CFM, and the space is de um, designed for 12 people. We run through the calculations. We get about 70.8 CFM of outdoor air per person, which is above the minimum requirement of 5 CFM. So again, there's just quick application of how using the VlasCalc with an IEQ probe can help uh, determine whether you meet the ASHRAE 62 minimum requirements for the amount of outdoor air per person. Another workflow is heat flow. So this is something that a, um, um, a test and balance contractor or a commissioning agent would, would be using to verify the, uh, uh, how efficient their, their system is. So basically with a thermal anemometer probe that measures velocity, calculates flow, uh, measures temperature and humidity, we, we would measure upstream of the uh, heating or cooling coil and then take measurements, and then we would go to the downstream and take measurements, and those measurements would appear in real time. So you can see on uh, some mechanical schedules on the, the lower right, uh, one's in um, um, imperial units of measure, and the other one's in metric, but you can see uh, there is a schedule for measuring uh, the capacity, mega BTU per hours or kilowatts, and again, this gets into uh, how efficient is your heating and cooling uh, system in relation to your, your ductwork and your overall HVAC system. So the, once you have, so we have a lot of measurements, taking a lot of data. Well, what do you do with it? Well, you, know, you can either write it down or take advantage of uh, uh, some of the logging app aspects. So there's multiple ways to uh, set up the the velocity calc to meet your logging needs. Uh, manual and auto save, those are basically discrete measurements, <clears throat> discrete saving. <clears throat> Excuse me. Place the probe in the airstream, let it stabilize, press a button, and you save it. Uh, continuous key and time, those are for long term unattended logging events. And then we also have what's called program one and program two and that is um, specific recipes or specific um, um, logging formats that are customized to meet your needs and uh, so you can kind of see an example there how you can use the track pro software that's not only used for download uh, receiving downloaded information but you can program the instrument too to do a specific logging events and then you can um, you know reset it or have it turn on, turn off, and at different points during the logging process. <clears throat> so once you have all that data, you know, so you have a, a lot of test IDs. Test IDs is just a way of segregating your, your data from, let's say, fume hood one to fume hood two. You'd have different test IDs. Um, once you have the data st stored, then you can uh, download it. Now, log data two, which is, uh, you know, the spreadsheet format that you see there, that's, that's most beneficial if you're taking spot measurements, doing a duct traverse, or doing like a fume hood or bio cabinets. Um, but with Track Pro, if you're doing uh, trending over time with an IEQ probe, so you set up your IEQ probe maybe early in the morning before anyone um, gets into the building, you're tracking and monitoring and, and logging uh, different uh, parameters, CO2, VOC, and then you can put a timestamp on it and see your data versus time. 
and that that would be used for you know trending over time you know what if there's a specific event that seems to be occurring at, at uh, specific times this is a way that you can capture it and then then uh, go back and diagnose and see what's going on uh, typically IEQ probes those are diagnostic probes so if you um, if you have an issue where your the temperature humidities or CO2s levels are too high or even too low um, generally uh, that would be used as a diagnostic tool okay I have an issue now I'm going to go back to uh, and see what's causing it if it's a VOC you know either a volatile organic compound issue can either minimize the uh, the source eliminate the source or get some extract to remove the fumes and then the uh, the other parameters would be just an indication of maybe some of your thermal comfort and your ventilation efficiency. So as far as models, um, you know, RACO, they, they definitely can help you uh, put together a kit. Um, we do have different models and different types of probes. Whatever, you know, we supply generally comes, it will come with a calibration kit. Uh, certificate, traceable NIST, batteries, downloading software, and so on. Uh, if you're looking for more information, we do have uh, our IEQ and training website. We have different handbooks, and definitely go to RACO. They're very knowledgeable staff. They can help you with your application needs and your rental needs. So we're getting close to the end here, and I just want to thank Rayco for hosting this event. And again, contact Rayco for all your instrument needs. They have a knowledgeable staff. Staff, they know their, they know their products, they know their customers, they know their industry, and they can easily help you uh, make the right right choice when it comes to rental or purchase needs. All right, thanks, Jim. We do have a couple questions here, so let me go through those. Um, First one is, where is the best spot to take a differential pressure measurement, do you, and do you need to take several measurements? Um, one thing with pressure is, pressure is, <laughs> I hate to say it, but pressure is pressure, meaning if you think a, a differential pressure measurement is basically two static pressure measurements at different points. Um, so in the... Uh, Measuring differential pressure, it's basically, let's say a, it's across a filter, it's a, a point upstream and a point downstream. You know, um, as far as multiple measurements, you don't necessarily, you don't, it's not like you need, need to do a, um, drill a bunch of holes and measure the differential pressure at, in, in a bunch of series of holes. Uh, since the air pressure, the static pressure is uniform in the ductwork, kind of like a balloon, um, you would not need to take uh, multiple static pressure or differential pressure measurements across the same filter. As far as distance, uh, rule of thumb, you know, use maybe about a 12, 14 inches upstream and downstream of the filter if you have, uh, if you have room. Um, if not, you just have to uh, you know, measure a little bit closer. But no, you don't need to take uh, a series of measurements for differential since uh, they're basically two static pressure measurements. Okay, next question. Having an active gas line connected to the biosafety cabinet, would that affect the airflow? Yes. Typically, um, if, the gas, if, if the gas line is... Um, when they test the bio cabinets, the... Uh, the certifier, they'll either do it as it's installed, new construction, or as um, as received or as left. So there may be times where there may be equipment within the bio cabinet which will affect the airflow and air patterns. So typically, um, um, and which it makes it more difficult for the uh, for the certifier to take measurements. Um, but if there is an active line in there. That will that could impact the the uniformity or the flow profile. Typically, when they when they certify the the fume uh, I'm sorry the bio hoods as they're installed, there's there's nothing in it, um, and that 
generally is going to be the best way to quantify um, what your uniformity is coming out of that, that HEPA filter. Um, but whether it's gas line or there's a bunch of equipment in there, that could affect the, the, the flow patterns, um, which is very common in fume hoods. There's, you know, I've been on jobs where you're calibrating a, a monitor or an alarm, and there's so much clutter within that fume hood that it, you, you can't get a good measurement, meaning there's a, a lot of blockage. You don't get your average face velocity. So um, in a lot of those situations, you know, actually it comes down to the lab manager and the fume hood user to, you know, use the hood properly. You know, don't have uh, stuff scattered, you know, all the way to the back, all the way to the front. Um, so it kind of gets more into good practices. But long story short, anything within the bio cabinet that uh, that's there during the time of measurement of downflow velocities can have an effect. Okay, next question. I'm using a 9565 at 7,000 feet, and it has been calibrated at the factory at STP. Do I need to correct the uh, foot per minute, or is there a button which you push to make the correction, or does the meter automatically adjust for the pressure difference? Great question. Well, good. Had a good slide on that one. Um, yes, what you're, uh, one, yes, they will need to, we calibrate everything to standard conditions, but at 7,000 feet, you're going to want to change the, the instrument to read to actual conditions. And at the top of the screen, it'll tell you whether it's standard or actual. So basically what you're going to have to do with your 9565 um, is go into the menu, scroll down to actual standard, uh, go into that menu, and select actual. And then uh, that will put you in the um, um, actual air density mode. We'll use the internal barometric pressure sensor at that L and measure the uh, barometric pressure at that higher elevation, which is probably going to be, what, like 24, 24 and a half inches of mercury. And in that application, if you don't do that, that could definitely be a difference between passing and failing. So, yeah, 7,000 feet, use actual air density to take your measurements and go into the menu of the 9565 and physically select actual as opposed to standard. Next question, what is the VOC minimum detection level, part per million or part per billion? Well, we didn't um, really go through the, uh, the VOC probes that much, but we have a low concentration and a high concentration probe. Uh, the low concentration up to about 20 ppb and the high concentration up to uh, 2,000 ppm. Um, so we do have two different probes. These, work, these probes work off of diffusion. Uh, there's no pump, and these VOC probes would, uh, would not be used for confined space testing. Uh, they're not intrinsically safe. They're mainly used for doing indoor air quality investigations. Um, but, yeah, you, we have a, both a low concentration and a high concentration, and um, the lower concentration is uh, probably the more predominant of the two. And uh, mm -hmm. we do have that information on the spec sheet and our resources. I'm sure Rayco can easily uh, uh, provide that detail to our end user as well. Okay. I've got a request to uh, provide a link to the IAQ handbook. Uh, we'll go ahead and get that on our website for you. Um, let's see. Next one is I have both rotating vane and thermo anemometers for supply slash return grills or hood faces, what benefit is the thermo over the vein? Since getting the vein, I've always used it as it seems to be more consistent. Well, one of the reasons we may get more consistency with the vein <clears throat> is it's a mechanical um, instrument. Um, you know, the vein spins based off of the velocity impinging on the, on the, on the vein blades. Uh, so you do get some inherent dampening so, um, meaning if there's fluctuating flows or velocity, um, you're not going to see the, the readings on your display jump uh, up or down as much with the thermal anemometer. Thermal anemometer, they, they are a uh, very fast response, 
You know, internally we take like 20, 20 readings per second. Um, but one thing that you can do is uh, inside the 9565 or in any of our um, models that, that use the, those, the hot wire or the rotating vane technology is there's a, um, a menu item called time constant. And the time constant can be set from anywhere from one to, uh, I believe, 30 seconds. So what that is, is um, it's used more for hot wires since they're fast acting. So if you put your, your thermal anemometer in an airstream and keeping this airstream and the readings are jumping up and down, now I can't make heads or tails. Uh, what you can go into is the time constant adjustment, put it to a longer time constant, let's say 10 seconds. And what happens then is um, now your readings will update every second, but it'll be the average over that um, uh, the last 10 seconds. So it'll be like a moving average. So it's going to be doing more averaging. Uh, it, so you won't see the readings jump around as much. Um, but that is a way to um, to adjust the speed of a response on your display is by using the uh, um, time constant adjustment. And again, since uh, hot wires are very fast acting, um, it's not uncommon for that time constant to be set to five or 10 seconds. And the last question, what are the guidelines for face velocities for various local exhaust ventilation applications? Example, welding, soldering, dip tanks. Um, that would be something that uh, may look at um, um, industrial hygiene guidelines, could be more of like OSHA guidelines, um, things of that nature. Uh, mainly it would determine uh, to be dependent on the uh, the tank itself, the plating tank. You know what does the the manufacturer of that tank recommend? Um, but as far as any guidelines, you know that may come for more of a you know from an IH authority. Okay. All right, Jim. Thank you very much for your presentation. If there are any other specific application questions, feel free to give us a call at eight six six rent EHS or 866-736-8347. You can also reach me by email at matt at racorents.com. If you want to know more about the technologies to supply, you can follow us on social media. We put a lots of good technical tips at my blog at blog at Raco Rents. You can also follow up on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do record all these training sessions, which you can find on YouTube under the Raco Rents channel. Uh, if there are any other... If if there are some topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars, please feel free to email me with the subject. We have access to lots of product and process specialists. Please let me know what we should cover, emailing me at matt at racorents.com. At this point, if there are no further questions, our presentation will conclude. Um, and um, one last comment was, uh, yes, the slides will be available. Um, all right. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And thanks again, Jim. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good day.